What's up, Internet? It's RJ with Roads to Liberty. I'm doing a little video today about how your feelings can cost me my freedom. Um, as you can tell, I'm a happy guy, right? I got palm trees and a smile on my shirt, so that means I'm obviously a happy dude. Um, but what makes me unhappy is the fact that otherwise good people, like this person I'm going to mention in this video, uh, not by name, but this person I had a debate with sort of last night on Twitter, otherwise good person in my book, caring, passionate, artistic, creative, positive thinking, upbeat kind of person, their feelings, like people with strong emotional responses to things, um, can effectually, eventually cost us our freedoms. So I'm going to get into this. Check it out. So people get hurt by the things they see and they read online, right? Like, I mean, that's just a natural consequence of the internet. If you see a meme or a post that you disagree with or that is a joke that you don't find funny or that hits too close to home, there's a chance that your feelings could be hurt, right? This is true of all of us, I think. Um, we all have probably our hot button issues that just make us feel kind of sad or whatever when we see it online. So this is at the crux of the issue that, that um, I was trying to debate and discuss with this person, although it didn't go well in the end. Um, so anywhere online, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, doesn't matter. Some people, these people with the feelings, right, the feelings people, can get into the mindset or the belief that it's the government's job to step in and impose rules on the internet or rules upon um, free speech that um, would force these websites to police their own users more strictly. So um, I couldn't get this person to actually come right out and specify examples of types of speech that, that they felt should be um, the types of speech they thought action should be taken against when they were when these types of speech were posted, which was a problem, which was a problem in me trying to make positive headway in understanding another person. Um, and that's another aspect of this feelings thing that I wanted to address in this video. So they they want people to this is what this person was saying. They want people to be banned um, basically for posting offensive content blocked by the site, but more so they actually wanted legal consequences to be brought against these people. So I disagree with the premise in general. I think you should be allowed to post whatever you want online as hurtful, as offensive, as weird, as dark, as whatever as you want, because these sites, every site that you can even think of has an ability to block, to follow, to unfollow, to friend or defriend. So Again, just like the free market, just like regular people with freedom of association can choose who and what they want to be associated with, the same is true of almost every single website. If you don't like what you see, you can block it or unfollow that person. If that person isn't followed by anybody or they're only followed by people that enjoy hate, hateful things, then they're in an echo chamber. They're not able to reach people like yourself or people who have um, a distaste for that sort of content. But this person thinks that the law needs to step in. So immediately I'm concerned and I'm saying, okay, well, let me just go down your road for a minute. Let me go into your premise. Suppose the law should step in. What sorts of speech are we talking about? What sorts of speech should the law police or should the law be involved with? Um, and so this all kind of got started with regards to the airport um, attack in Istanbul, um, which... I should take a moment to at least make clear, I my heart goes out to people who are affected by any kinds of violence or bloodshed or, or whether it's political or religious violence. Um, I, hate, I, I, I can't stand to see that sort of thing. Um, and it happens way too frequently in the world. And my hearts and prayers go out to the people who are affected and whose families are affected by these sorts of events. That being said, I don't see the solution in being more government and less freedom, um, although this person did, right? So when I was speaking to this person online, they wanted to lump together a number of different types of, of speech or online speech, hateful content, racist content, sexist content, um, harassing, shaming, or terror planning. 
Uh, the other thing they mentioned were videos that people would post that were private. Like I might have a video that I have that you may have sent me in the past, um, whatever type of content, sexual in nature or whatever, and then to where I could post that and then cause, it's as this person said, cause you to commit suicide. Um, so let me try to break this all down. Hateful content is extremely, extremely vague, extremely broad. So I hate the Knicks or you hate the Mets. All right, well, that's fine, <laughs> right? I hate coffee. I, I hate rainy days. That's not hateful content like me saying, I hate, you know, fill in ethnicity or fill in, you know, group name. I'm not gonna, you know, even use an example here for fear of rustling somebody's gym, jimmies like I did last night. But you get my point, right? Hateful speech is very broad and it's not a clear enough distinction to where you can say, let's ban hateful speech. Well, I hate sugar. <laughs> where is that ban? Is that we're gonna ban that? So where's this line, right? Racist speech. Well, let me be a little bit more specific. If I say something against African Americans or against Native Americans or against Cubans, um, and it's directly, clearly hateful, I could see how more people would be in favor of that being regulated or restricted. But what if I said? Ah, uh, the white man's causing all my problems. Or I said, um, what's with men being horny and just wanting sex all the time? Well, that's that's a gender, um, not race, but that's a gender dichotomy or, or type of free speech that is a little bit more accepted than me saying, ah, women should just be in the kitchen, da-da-da-da-da. Um, so is there a double standard here, right? Um, sexism, genderism. Well, if I'm uncomfortable with transgender people to whatever degree, in my bathroom, um, just in general, seeing basically what I consider to be a man dressed as a woman in drag or a woman dressed up to look like a man, am I not allowed to express that I'm uncomfortable? I get it if I said something very violent or like, oh, they should all be X, Y, and Z, you know, blah, 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 burned at the stake. I'm not saying that that should be restricted, but I get where that crosses a line. But this person was unwilling to explain to me where this line should be. And even if we establish a line in the sand where, okay, this type of speech serves no value, da 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 da, da whatever, it can't be useful in any way. What's the consequences? What do we? What, what should be the consequences? Do do the people go to jail for saying something online? I mean, this happens in other countries. I mean, I'm I'm strongly against that. Um harassing I mean that again it's so vague to say harassing content if someone is homosexual or is of a certain ethnicity um, or religious belief and another person just gets off on picking on them to me the fastest and most um, convenient solution for this is to just block or ban that person from your account that way you can carry about saying and being who you want to be and that person is out of your life. They can't, you know, they can create a new account just to pick on you, but, you know, that game of cat and mouse is going to get old for that person. It takes a minute to create an account. You have a new email address, da 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 da. And you just get banned after the first post or tweet. So it's kind of like the power remains in each of our hands to, to police our own platform. Um, but people aren't apparently satisfied with this. They want someone to step in, some authority to step in and literally police it with with punishments jail fines that sort of thing um touching on the video thing like if i posted a video of you that i somehow got my hands on and it caused you co to commit suicide I, I disagree with that whole premise again you can't force someone to commit suicide if you really go through with that you're talking about murder you're not talking about suicide if i post a picture of you or a video of you online that's suggestive in some way or shows you doing something that makes you embarrassed or whatever, I didn't cause you to commit suicide. If, if you can't handle the fact that that happened to you and just deal with it and move on with your life and then that causes you to kill yourself, well, you're a fragile egg. I mean, I'm not trying to blame the victim here, but if you took a video of yourself thinking no one will ever see this, I have the right to take videos of myself and no one's allowed to post them. That's called a positive right. It means I have the right to stop you from doing something. 
Not really. If you take a video of yourself, you run a risk. You take a risk. Okay, I want a, uh, I want a record of what I um, did. I want a proof that I did this, or I want to be able to watch myself doing something that I did in the past. Great, but be mindful that that could get out into the wrong hands, and if it does, and that's going to embarrass you, then maybe you don't want to take that video, or maybe you want to be very careful about how that video gets passed around. Maybe you don't want to share it with people. So I don't buy into this whole... I need to restrict myself so that I can protect your freedoms. Um, this person argued that it was a public space, meaning the internet. The internet is not a public space. Um, it's a public utility to some extent in the sense that we all sort of share into it. And I say we all, I mean a bunch of companies for the most part. Verizon might get you online or, or Comcast or Dish Network might get you to the internet, but the actual wires, the actual servers, the actual websites are all independently and privately owned. And these people are all doing that for gain, for their own personal private gains, profit-wise. And if it ever becomes expensive for them to be there, to, to offer those services, they're not gonna wanna gain from it. They're, you know, like if you can't advertise on your website because there's a law saying if you have X, Y, and Z type of content, you're not allowed to run ads or you're not even allowed to be a website, the internet will just get smaller. So the notion that it's a public space is a fallacy the, or is just incorrect. The internet is owned privately and therefore the owners of Twitter, the owners of Facebook, the owners of Instagram or whomever, whatever websites were on or pages or sites were on, those owners have the right to regulate what happens on those pages. They don't have the right to bang your door down and cuff you and throw you in a cage, but they have a right to block your account or to take down your posts. People complain all the time, oh, Facebook banned me, oh, what a, what a fascistic, you're on a private website. That's like you coming into my deli and then I throw you out because I don't like what you're talking about. That's within my right in my world. I, I, don't, I don't like the notion that I have to allow things in my house. If, if you're in my house or you're in my place of business and I don't like what I hear or what I see, it's not a public space. I paid for that building. I pay rent there. I built it. I maintain it. I insure it. That's my space. I'm responsible for it. So I can decide if I don't want you there. So if people have a problem, they need to take it up with Twitter, with Facebook, with whatever, or find a website where there's not... Uh, you know, there's a very strict, you know, anti-harassment policy. Um, this person also said, we use the internet to keep each other awake and informed. Um, but it's also used as a target, uh, used to target weak minds into joining terrorist organizations. I disagree with two things there. One, I don't think that a lot of weak minds are coursed into doing terrorism based on what they see online. Um, I'm sure it happens to some small extent, but I don't think that it happens enough or to the degree that it's worthwhile to allow governments to come in and police the internet for free speech. Um, if we use the internet to keep people awake and informed, then why was this person having such a hard time having a, you know, a little bit more of a touchy conversation with me? You know, could, how, why was it so difficult for the person to understand that I was trying to find a specific example of types of speech that they thought should be policed. And then I was going to take it to the next step and say, okay, so what should be the consequence? If I post X, Y, Z, what should be my punishment? What do you think I should be? Should I be thrown in jail? Should I be fined? And who decides this, right? So if this person's like, well, this should be a law, this should be this. Well, okay, so who decides? Do you decide? Are you the queen or king of the internet? Do you get to just pick who goes to jail and what the punishments are? What are the chances that there could be some legal policy regarding restriction of um, what we're allowed to say online, freedom of speech online, that everyone's just going to agree with. It's, it's impossible. So again, the clear way is to just let the sites handle this. But I found it interesting that the person said that we use the internet to keep each other awake and informed. Well, I'm trying to awake you to my perspective and inform you of a problem with freedom of speech. And the person got so offended because of the two examples I said, which I'll get to right now, that they... You know, they, they didn't ban me or block me to my knowledge, but they said, you know, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And I respected that. So, okay, no problem. You know, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I was trying to explain a point, but okay, no problem. But anyway, so I said, 
a few examples. I said, hey, um, you're a bad dancer. Is that the type of speech that is hurtful or offensive? And they said, no, not like that. Okay, so that's not hurtful enough. I said, um, I don't like your clothes. I don't like the way you look. No, that's not bad enough. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, I said, if I see a man wearing a dress and I say, LOL, crying emoticon, OMG. She didn't respond to that one. She's like, nah, you know, whatever. So she didn't say, like, that's, that I didn't cross the line yet. Then I said, what if I see a picture of two men kissing and I say, ew, I hate fags. Now, again, I'm not saying that's what I think. I'm saying, what if someone were to say that? What if I were to say that? The fact that I said it at all, the fact that I typed it in and sent it, that was what pushed her over the edge. Oops, I let the gender out of the person I was talking to. Whatever, that's, that's what pushed the person over the edge that they were like, I can't talk to you anymore. Someone in my family is gay and you're saying hateful things. This is at the crux of why this is such a big issue for me and why this is such a big problem, right, in my mind. If all it takes is saying it, even if I'm trying to make an example, trying to get clarity on a topic, and this person's ready to say, I can't have this conversation anymore. Oh my God, my feels have been hurt. What does that say about where we are as a species? I mean, let's just say Western culture, because I'm just talking to someone in America, I'm in America, um, where actually I know this person in real life, to tell you the truth. So what does this say about where we're at as a culture that I was able to offend this person just by trying to make an example? I mean, this is the level of sensitivity that, that we're dealing with in a certain, I mean, I don't know how big this portion of the population is, but it's a, it's a percentage. Whether it's 10%, 50%, we don't know. So the person essentially said that they refused to stoop to the level of posting something offensive, even if it was only to clarify their position. So I asked them, can you please tell me what, what types of speech you think should be policed? Well, we got into a little bit of a catch-22 here, a little bit of a paradox, because they can't even post it themselves to give an example. So how can we actually know what people who have sensitivities are, are willing to tolerate and what they're not willing to tolerate when they can't even bring themselves to say it as an example, let alone hear it in reality from someone who really feels this way. Um, they tried using an example saying that bullying is punished in school um, so that that's a framework for how this should work online. Um, I pointed out that kids aren't thrown in jail or fined, you know, no more school lunch for you for two weeks because you bullied somebody. If anything, they get a suspension or a timeout, but it's not, and plus we're talking about children, and I'm not saying I even agree with that sort of policy, but we're talking about children who the notion there is that they're developing and that there's a custodial aspect of school. Like I'm in charge of your kids for the day. I'm gonna try to take your family values and continue them here at school. That's at least the notion, right? So as adults online posting freely, Twitter doesn't have the responsibility, or Facebook or whomever doesn't have the responsibility to make me a good person. That's that's insane to me, right? I mean, tell me if you agree or disagree. I think we have that responsibility ourselves to be the best people we think we can be, and it's not up to Facebook or Twitter to try to craft or shape who we are. So nice try on that person's part. At least this is where they were starting to try to um, actively participate in the conversation a little bit more. But it, it didn't it didn't sway me and for the reasons I said. Um, I mentioned freedom of speech. As I said, I tried to flesh out examples of speech and try to find that person's line. Um, you know, like I said, the person had an inability to distinguish the difference between hateful speech and speech that was being used in the sense of making an example to try to explain what we're actually talking about. So this shows the extreme sensitivity of people, like I said. This, this shows that some people are extremely sensitive and that sensitivity is what leads them to want someone else, the government, a nanny, a police, someone to step in and protect their feelings. Um, and I think that's a very potentially dangerous situation and I don't know what the, out, the answer is. That's, that's why I'm making this video because I want, I want the audience to tell me what they think the, out, the, the solution is here. My fear is that if enough people are able to persuade policymakers or whomever, um, the owners of social media networks, that, that they want speech policed, 
in a, in a more strict way, we're going to lose a lot of humor. We're going to lose, you lose a lot of comedy. We're going to lose a lot of people just expressing themselves and trying to, even if you have bad ideas, even if you are, you know, racist or sexist or whatever, I think the way to help people change those po points of views to something more helpful and positive and loving and caring or whatever is for them to be allowed to express it and then to allow people to respond back and say, hey, you know, why do you feel that way? Um, what do you have against this or what do you have against that? Or, you know, having a dialogue, you know, just censoring, just covering people's mouths when they say something negative isn't going to make those feelings go away. The reason people say things is because that's how they feel. The reason people feel things is because that's what they were taught. That's what they think. So you think, so you feel, so you will do. That's the process. That's the chain. The things we do are just the manifestations of what we think and then how we how those thoughts make us feel and then we express ourselves like I'm making this video. So to me, this is scary. Um, I'm afraid of free speech being trampled on just like a lot of the other human rights we have as regular people are trampled on. Um, I want to know from you guys, do you think this is becoming a problem um, where a large amount of people are going to become in favor of such kind of government interventions on online speech? Um, how can we discuss the merits of this type of approach, the, the censorship approach, without ourselves being quickly lumped into the category of hateful people or people who would defend bullying online? And will that chilling effect of, I don't want to hurt my friends or my family members or my online followers by sharing my position of pro-speech, pro-freedom, because they're going to take it wrong and think that I'm protecting the bullies. Is there an approach that will work with that? Or do we just hold our noses and jump into the, the ocean of, I don't care about hurting your feelings because I want to defend freedom? Um, I know history probably has these answers, and that's what I'm going to meditate on myself, is think about, you know, during the civil rights era, how people would say, you know, look, I'm not for black people not being allowed to eat at this restaurant, you know, or I want I want to allow black people to eat at my restaurant and having other customers say, well, I'm not going to eat here then, you know, whatever the case may be. People that did take a stand were willing to lose back then. They were willing to, they were willing to um, risk their own personal loss by taking a stand for something they believed in. And today it's the opposite. The people that are hurt by some social thing and they think they're being progressive or whatever, they're willing to make other people take a loss. They don't want to take a loss. They're willing to let other people take a loss so that they don't have to feel bad, so that their ideal world can be the reality, um, even if it includes censorship and this soft, cushy kind of protected space where only happy rainbows and unicorns can be posted online. Um, so the last question I'll put towards you guys is, can sensitive people be reached at all with logic? If you're super sensitive, highly emotional, um, can logic reach that person to persuade them? Or is their brain just formed by the feelings and the emotions so much that you have to somehow translate your logical thought into a feelings, emotional based message? And is that, how do we do that? How do we translate our concern for freedom and free speech and human rights into an emotional message that doesn't somehow get misconstrued as us being in favor of bullies or in favor of um, hate. So that's where I'm at, guys. This was a big thing for me uh, over the past 24 hours. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of racking my brain here. I'm sort of, you know, I'm glad I got this out there for you guys. Um, I'm thankful to anybody that you know took the time to watch this video and has something insightful or productive or helpful to say because the internet's just the first leg of the table. You take the internet out, the table still stands. That's one leg. There's three legs left. The next leg that comes down is going to be real life where you can't say something on the street. You can't wear a t-shirt that says certain things on it. You can't say something in public um, on the elevator or... or whatever the case may be, you can't express yourself in certain ways because freedom of expression, freedom of speech is in the crosshairs right now. Society, not just the government, society is willing to attack this edifice of freedom that we haven't been given by the, the uh, Constitution. We haven't been given this by the government. We have this as a natural right, as a natural human right. I have a mouth, I have vocal cords, I have thoughts, I'm allowed to express it doesn't hurt anyone to hear words. Even if it hurts you, your feelings a little bit, 
you could say words back and that might hurt my feelings and I'm okay with that. So this is really part of, I think, evolution to where we have a right to express ourselves. We have a, a, a right to sort our ideas out. And if you don't have something to say or if what you have to say you feel isn't strong enough of a point to, to battle the thing you're hearing, then maybe you should go and meditate on what it is you think or feel and see if you really agree with what your feelings are telling you or whether you might be able to come up with a better way to share that point of view with someone else. So this is where I'm at, guys. Pick up where I left off. Tell me what you think about this whole censorship question and how we can sort of protect ourselves from, from the people with the feelings um, eventually having their way and censoring our world. Peace out, guys. Subscribe, like, and share. Peace. Thanks.